Welcome to lesson 64 of Hunger and Thirst for Righteousness. And so this one's called, What is Elohim Doing? What is he doing? What is he doing? What is he doing? What is he doing? And so I love this lesson because it's, uh, like I said, the closer we are getting and the deeper we're getting in these classes, we are leaving the flesh. And leaving the flesh is not only in, um, how do I say this, the things you talk about, but it's also about your perception when you're leaving the flesh, you are leaving a fleshly human perception where we are down in this world and we are only looking at what people are doing. But you're leaving that fleshly per perception and you're moving into God's perception, a heavenly perception that's looking down on the whole grand picture. What is Elohim doing? What is Elohim doing? And so I love this lesson because it's also a very good lesson to know in your own perception um, where are you at? Where are you at? You know, are you still deep in flesh where there's no consideration of what God is doing and it's only about what people are doing? Or are you deep, deep, deep in the spirit about what is God doing? Because that's the ultimate picture is what is God doing? People have no um, say so in the will of God. The will of God is set in stone by him. And so... We'll get into this today. Um, a famous verse we all know is that uh, the battle is not flesh and blood. It's with spiritual rules in high places. Well, this is the base of this message is understanding, looking past the flesh of what's going on. So we're going to read the same passage that we started off with in the last lesson in 1 Kings 12. Um, and we're going to read this for another purpose of understanding today. So 1 Kings 12, here we go. Then Rehoboam went to Sheshem, for all Israel had come to Sheshem to make him king. Now when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, heard of it, he was living in Egypt, for he was yet in Egypt, where he had fled from the presence of King Solomon. Then they sent and called him, and Jeroboam and all the assembly of Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam, saying, Your father made our yoke hard. Now therefore lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke, which he put on us, and we will serve you. Then he said to them, depart for three days, then return to me. So the, so the people departed. Then King Rehoboam consulted with the elders who had served his father, Solomon, while he was still alive, saying, how do you counsel me to answer this people? Then they spoke to him, saying, if you will be a servant to this people today and will serve them and grant them their petition and speak good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. But he forsook the counsel of the elders which they had given him and consulted with the young men who grew up with him and served him. So he said to them, what counsel do you give that we may answer this people who have spoken to me, saying, lighten the yoke which your father has put on us? The young men who grew up with him spoke to him, saying, thus you shall say, you shall say to this people who spoke to you, saying, your father made our yoke heavy. Now you make it lighter for us. But you shall speak to them, my little finger is thicker than my father's loins. Whereas my father loaded you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplines you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. Then Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam on the third day, as the king had directed, saying, Return to me on the third day. The king answered the people harshly, for he forsook the advice of the elders which, he had, which they had given him. And he spoke to them according to the advice of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. So the king, so the king did not listen to the people, for it was a turn of events from the Lord, that he might establish his word. Which the Lord spoke through Ahijah the Shelanite the, uh, to Jeroboam the son of Nebat. Okay. Now, as we are reading this, we are yes, we see everything that happened. We've already talked about the situation. I'm not going to get deep into explaining the situation again. If you don't know what really happened, you need to go back to the last lesson. I talked about it more. Today we're here for this last verse of this situation where it says, "So the king did not listen to the people." For it was a turn of events from the Lord that he might establish his word, which the Lord spoke through Ahijah, the Shelanite, to Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. So this verse is revealing the purpose of why all these physical things happen. Why? Why did the king not listen to the people? 
And this is weird to understand that, yes, there, there's levels. We talk, we talk about sanctification, day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, day seven. There's levels to sight. And as we're talking about this, you're not condemned. I'm not even telling you that you uh, have a, a sight of death or you have no sight at all. I'm telling you that it's time to grow up in your sight. That there's the extremely fleshly perspective where you're looking at people and you're saying, oh, it's because the king doesn't listen to, to people. And, you know, it's because whatever it is, because the king, right? Then there's a higher perspective than that where you say, oh, well, well, it's about the heart. It's about his heart. His heart is why he didn't listen to the people. But I'm trying to tell you, there's a, there's a higher perspective than even looking at people's hearts and saying this is the, the heart is why. Well, there's a there's a higher perspective than that. Because why his heart is the way it is and why he has the physical action that he has is there's a greater reason why those things even exist. And the greater reason why is said in this verse. It was a turn of events from the Lord that he might establish his word. So why was the king's heart this way? So that his so the Lord's word would be established. Why did the people even come to him, even asking him to lighten their load? So the word of the Lord was established. Today, I'm hoping that this lesson, that you hear it and you heed to it and you accept the goodness and peace of God and joy that God has for you, that is in his perspective, if you love him. This is why the word says those, those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Well, guess what? That is a changing of your perception. That's a changing. Your spirit is your heart. That's a changing of, of how you see as a truth. He's saying you're worshiping him in his perspective. His perspective is truth. So once again, a higher perspective. We can nitpick with the king's heart. The last lesson was even less spiritually appraised than this one. I'll tell you the truth. The last one we talked about the king's heart. This is higher than the last lesson. Because what's greater than even picking apart someone's heart is why is their heart that way? And the reason why is it so the Lord may establish his word. And I didn't put this in here, but we're, we're going to talk about a lot of things in a second anyway. I didn't put this example in here because I didn't want to make this lesson too long for you guys. I know I, there are things I'm going to mention and I always give you the verses. But if you go back to Exodus and you see the Lord literally telling Moses that, listen, the, the Pharaoh's not going to listen to you. And it literally says at one point, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Something you have to understand is you can't even, and we live in a world where you can't even blame people for the heart that they have. Because who can purify their own heart? Nobody. If you really understood, everything is in the Lord's sovereign, it's in, everything is in his hands. The hardening of hearts and the softening of hearts, the purifying of hearts and the impurifying of hearts. It's all in his hands. And this is where you start to understand the Bible. The more spirit, the less spiritually appraised the writing is, which we will talk about this deeper as time goes. And I don't think we've actually, I've actually revealed that to you yet and talked to you about the spiritually appraising of the Bible and, and what that is. But if you start in Genesis, things look like they're in people's hands, right? You think you think everything is in the, a person's hands. It's a person's. Uh, it's, it was his choice, right? But the deeper you get in this, in this Bible, you get over to Revelation, you see clearly that nothing is anybody's choice. It's all written and it's all planned out. And the Lord has known what he's doing from the beginning to the end. So like I said, the deeper you get into the spirit, the more you understand that God is sovereign and that it is not people's choices as why they are doing what they are doing. The deeper you get in the Bible, you get in the revelation, it starts talking about destiny. 
Some of those who are destined to go to prison will go to prison. Those who are destined to die by the sword will die by the sword. And this is the faith and the perseverance of the saints. If you even go all the way back to when Jesus showed up in the flesh, he starts saying that I chose you, you didn't choose me. So the reality is that if you have a perception that people choose Jesus, your, your eyesight is not even at day three yet. Because you still believe that there's a flesh choice in all the matter. <laughs> so let's continue on. Lamentations 2.17. The Lord has done what he purposed. He has accomplished his word, which he commanded from days of old. He is thrown down without sparing, and he has caused the enemy to rejoice over you. He has exalted the might of your adversaries. Once again, this, this verse is pointing to the sovereignty of God. The Lord has done what he purposed. And you have to understand how much more joy and peace you will have in this world when you submit yourself to the will of God, when you stop fighting the will of God. When you, you, you will not be sad and depressed any longer in this world. When you begin to believe the Lord has done what he purposed, there is no mistake. Accompanied by your belief that he is good, there can be no depression. It can't be. When I'm depressed, I'm sad about an event in my past that I wish went differently. But if you had full belief in, so in the sovereignty of God and that he is making choices and he is doing what he has purposed to do. And that he is good accompanied with his goodness. That's that's what something that's needed is, is this accompaniment, accompany um, this marriage. Also, not only believing that he is sovereign, but also believing that he is a good sovereign God. But look at his sovereignty in this verse. The Lord has done what he has purposed. He has accomplished his word, which he commanded from days of old. He's going to accomplish his word. He is thrown down without sparing. Is he who is thrown down? People are not falling themselves or they're not throwing themselves down. He is throwing down without sparing and he has caused the enemy to rejoice over you why is your your enemies rejoicing over you is it because of them is it because of you no it's because he decided it he he has exalted the might of your adversaries why are your enemies and your adversaries exalted is it because of them something they're doing no it's because he decided it Let's keep going. Isaiah 40, 46, 8 to 9. Remember this and be assured. We're called to mind, you, transgress, you transgressors. Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. Let's keep going. Declaring the end from the beginning. Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things which have not been done. Saying my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Calling a bird of prey from the east and the man of my purpose from a far country. Truly I have spoken. Truly I will bring it to pass. I have planned it. Surely I will do it. The sovereignty of God. Do you believe it is the question? Or are you still strifing with what you see people doing? Or are you looking to God and asking, Elohim, what are you doing? What are you doing? I love this, declaring the end from the beginning. And he said, listen, what I said in the beginning, I'm declaring the end from the beginning. I have already decided.
I have already declared the end from the beginning. Which means I'm not making up things of how things are going to go as time goes. No, I have already decided from the beginning how this is going to go. And from ancient times, things which have not been done. He's literally telling you that in ancient times, I have I have declared things to be done that have not been done in the past. Saying my purpose will be established. Which is why if you are not living for his purpose, you cannot have joy and peace in this world. Because his purpose is going to be established. Yours is not. And I will accomplish all my good pleasure. He is going to accomplish his good pleasure. And I love it because it's, it's, although he says he's doing what he wants as his pleasure, right? He says, my pleasure is good, though. The things that please me, that give me pleasure are good pleasures. And I'm going to accomplish them. And there's no one I'm not. I'm going to say, oh, I'm sorry how this makes you feel. I'm not going to do what I what I what I uh, my good pleasure because of how you feel. No, he knows his pleasure is good. He's going to accomplish it. And it doesn't matter what you think. <laughs> Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my purpose from a far country. Truly, I have spoken. Truly, I will bring to pass. Truly, I have spoken. Truly, I will bring it to pass. I have planned it. We were talking about God's plan. God has a major plan and he is not deviating from his plan for anybody. And there's nothing that he's seen that's shocking of his plan. People actually think the Lord was shocked that Adam and Eve ate from the tree knowledge of good and evil. <laughs> How was he shocked if he had a lamb slain from the beginning of the foundation of the world before Adam and Eve, he had already slain the lamb that was going to be sent into the world to be slain for art. It was going to be physically manifested to be slain later because it already happened in the spirit. Everything that happens in the spirit is physically manifested in his life. And he literally told the, the woman that your seed was going to, uh, what did he say? He said it was going to uh, smash the head of the serpent. He told that woman the future. He already knew what was going to happen. He already knew. I have planned it. Surely I will do it. If he plans it, he's going to do it. Isaiah 55, 9 to 10. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout and furnishing the seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. For you will go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth into shouts of joy before you and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush, the cypress will come up and instead of the, ne of the nettle, the myrtle will come up. And it will be a memorial to the Lord for an everlasting sign, which will not be cut off. So the beginning of this is the very direct point we're here. So am I, well, the middle of it, because we read, obviously we read more than the, um, before verse 11. But it says, so will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire. So once again, I'm giving you all these words of God to understand he has a desire, he has a plan, and it is going to be accomplished. It is going to be accomplished. There is no man's will being accomplished. It is the Lord's will that's being accomplished. 
looking at man's desires is going to get you nowhere because their desires are not what's coming true in this world. The Lord's desires are what's coming true in this world. Now, that's why when you delight yourself in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. Why is that? Because when your delight is the Lord, your pleasure is the Lord. Which means in what the Lord is doing and what he has said is going to come about. Your desires will be will, will be fulfilled because your desires are becoming in line with his desires. So you have much more joy. You'll have much more your prayers answered when your heart is in line with wanting what he the purpose that he has purposed in this world. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go into. Um, Give me one second. Okay, we're going to go into the Gospel of Matthew. And in this Gospel of Matthew, there is um, a lot of fulfillments of the Word of God. And like I said, when you're reading the Bible, when you're reading and you're, and you're trying to understand this Word of God, when you read Matthew... You'll see clearly, and it's not even just in Matthew. We're just using Matthew today. We're using one gospel because I could give you every gospel and we could be on here for, for five hours. But we're going to use one gospel today. And you're going to see clearly how many things happened in Jesus Christ's journey was to fulfill the word of God. Is that we ask ourselves all the time when you read the gospels, why did Jesus do this? Why did he do that? Why did he do this? Why did he do that? But you have to understand that the greatest perception you can have when it comes to why Jesus did what he did was to fulfill the word of the Lord. To fulfill. And I love this because we kind of just had a situation where people, someone was doing wrong and they were doing wrong to fulfill the word of the Lord. But now we have a situation in Christ where people are doing right to fill the word of God. But this is why, how you have to understand, you know, when you know what you know and you become aware, although it's not your choice, being intentional in your heart, you're proving his choice with your choices. You are proving his choice with your choices. Is he using you to fulfill his word by you doing evil and doing wrong like the devil? <laughs> Or is he fulfilling his word by you doing right in your life like Jesus Christ? But this is where free will meets sovereignty. Is that in our sight and in our lives, we do feel like we have a choice. You feel like you have a choice. But you have to understand that your choices are, are, are validating or they are um, revealing God's choice, actually. Your choice are not your choices. Your choice of revealing God's choice for your life and what you're going to do and what you're not going to do. So let's go and get into it. We got um, a couple good examples in Matthew of fulfilling the word of God. Okay. So Matthew 1, starting off Matthew 1. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to, jo uh, uh, betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. Now, love this, because why? Why was Mary chosen to carry Jesus as a virgin to fulfill the word of God? It's not about Mary. It's not about Joseph. It's not about, not, it's not about any of those things. It's not about her. It's not about her. This happened to fulfill the word of the Lord. Amen. Let's keep going. Matthew 2. 
Then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all his vicinity from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the Magi. Then what had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because they were no more. So why did Herod kill all the children under two years old at this time? Was it because of who Herod was? Was it because of uh, the children? Was it even because of Jesus? It was because fulfillment of the word of the Lord, which Jesus is the word. So I say that lightly as I say because of Jesus. But if you really understand, we know Jesus is the word. Okay. Yet, like I said, it is to fulfill the word of God. That's why he killed all those children. That's why. So you have to understand when you're reading, uh, when you're uh, 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 watching the news and you're seeing massacres and you're seeing, you know, we saw 9-11, this plane coming to the, in the uh, going to the towers, you're seeing wars, you're seeing all these things, all this death, whatever you see. Why is this happening? Is it because of uh, Caucasian children in America? Is it because of Muslims? Is it because of... Blah, 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 blah? No, it's not because of none of that. It's to fulfill the word of God. Let's keep going. We're also going to stay in Matthew 2 uh, for a little bit more. It says so. So Joseph got up and so Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Then, after being warned by God in a dream, he left for the regions of Galilee and came and lived in the city called Nazareth. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets: He shall be called a Nazarene. So, once again. Why did he grow up in Nazareth? Was it because of Joseph's fear? No. Was it because this king that was in, uh, that was taking the place of his father Herod? No. Was it even because of the dream that Joseph had? It led him there, but no. The reason why all those things happen, the reason why the dream happened, the reason why the king uh, uh, set in the place of his father, the reason why his fear, Joseph had that fear. Why was it to fulfill the word, of, the word of God that he should be called a Nazarene? Matthew 3. Then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan coming to John to be baptized by him. But John tried to prevent him saying, I have need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? But Jesus answering him, uh, answering said to him, permit it at this time. For in this way it is, it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he permitted him. Why did Jesus get baptized by John the Baptist? Was it because it was his cousin? No. Was it because John was the greatest baptizer that uh, the John was baptizing the most people at this time. No. Why was it? It was to fulfill all righteousness, which when we read righteousness is doing right by God. It was to fulfill God's desire, his purpose. Did he not just say he's going to send his word out and is going to fulfill his desire? Jesus is the word and he's fulfilling the desire of God. That's why he did what he did. That's why. Matthew 4, 12 to 13. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been taken to custody, he withdrew into Galilee and leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light, and those who were sitting in the land in shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. So, why, 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 why? 
why was Jesus in Galilee? Why was he in Capernaum? Why was he in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali? Why was he there? Was it because his cousin John had got arrested? That's the fleshy perspective. No. John was put in custody the time he was put in custody. Which called Jesus to go there. Because why? To fulfill the word of God. That is why. That's why. That's why Jesus had a reaction to his, his cousin going to prison the way he did. That's why his cousin went to prison to fulfill the word of God. So when things happen in your life and you have a cousin, you have a brother, you have a sister, you have an auntie, you have an uncle, you have a brother. I'm sorry, I said brother. No, man, I didn't. Brother, sister, you have a mother, you have a father, uh, whatever it is in your life. And something happens to them. They go to the, they go to jail. They pass away. Whatever it is. Why is this happening? You need to seek the word of God as to why this is happening in your life. And what word of God is he trying to fulfill in my life? What is he trying to fulfill? Matthew 8, when Jesus came into Peter's home, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick in bed with a fever. He touched her hand, the fever left her, and she got up and waited on him. When evening came, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with the word and healed all who were ill. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. He himself took our infirmities and carried away our diseases. So, once again, why? Why was he healing these people? Why were these people healed? Was it because of who they were? No. It was to fulfill the word of God. Spoken through Isaiah the prophet. That he himself took our infirmities and carried away our diseases. That's why he is healing diseases. It's not because of you. It's not because of you. It's because of his word. Matthew 12, 15, 18. But Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there. Many followed him and he healed them all and warned them not to tell who he was. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul was well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he shall proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A battered reed he will not break off, and a smoldering wick he will not put out, until he leads justice to victory, and in his name the Gentiles will hope. So, let's go back. Why? Why? Why did he heal people and then tell them, warn them not to tell who he was? Why is that? It says it very clearly in the word of God. Is it nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets? A battered reed he will not break off, and a smoldering wick he will not put out. He will not quarrel nor cry out. Nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. This verse literally is saying that he will be discreet. So why was he discreet in his ministry? Why was he quiet? Why was he telling people don't tell anyone? Why was he having all these private uh, private uh, uh, instances with people because of the word of God. That's why. Matthew 13. It says, And the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? Jesus answered them, To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. For whoever has, to him more should be given, and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because while seeing they do not see, and while hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. In their case the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, You will keep on hearing... 
but will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull. With their ears, they scarcely hear, and, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they will see with their ears, hear with, uh, I'm sorry, see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and return, and I would heal them. So, once again, what does it say? A prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled. You will keep on hearing, but will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. So, once again, he, they ask him why he's doing this. And he's literally saying that, listen, the reason why I'm speaking in parables is because the word of God. That they will keep on hearing and will not hear. They will keep on, or say, keep on hearing, but will not understand. They will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. That's why he spoke to them in, 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 in parables, because this must remain true. But they'll hear me, but they'll never understand. That's the word of God. <laughs> That's the word of God. And I'm trying to tell you, this is something as a messenger of God and all these things. You cannot strife with this. Do you know how people I know are striving with this and why they cannot move forward in their sanctifying journey with Jesus Christ? Because they cannot accept that it's God's will for many to not understand. Jesus respected it. So why can't you respect the word of God? Matthew 13, we'll stay right here. All these things Jesus spoke to the crowds in parables and he did not speak to them without a parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the foundation of the world. So once again, in the same chapter, he gives you another prophecy of why he speaks in parables. As he literally says the, in the, uh, to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the foundation of the world. I love this. Two different things. One, he's saying, I speak in parables. Why? One, to fulfill the will of God, to fulfill the word of God. But two, he's literally also admitting that in my parables, I'm telling them the truth from the beginning, from the foundation of the world. Now, where they understand, I understand they don't, but I'm telling them the truth. So and that's the thing I love about the Lord is that he's telling the truth. You just have to understand to know the truth. Next, it says, then when Judas, who had been betrayed, who, who had betrayed him, saw that he had been condemned, he felt remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, what is that to us? See to that yourself. And he threw the pieces of silver in the temple sanctuary and departed, and he went away and hanged himself. The chief priest took the pieces of silver and said, It is not lawful to put them into the temple treasury, since it is the price of blood. And they conferred together, and with the money, uh, with the money bought the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. For this reason, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then that which was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. They took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of the one whose price um, had been set by the sons of Israel, and they gave them for, for the potter's field as the Lord directed me. Now, I love this because this goes all the way back. <laughs> it goes very far back. It goes far back to the, to the sons of Israel selling uh, Joseph to the Ishmaelites. It goes all the way back. We have to understand this. Why did, Judas, why did Judas receive 30 pieces of silver? To fulfill the word of God. Why did he return the 30 pieces of silver? To fulfill the word of God. Why did the, the, the Jews, when they got the, the piece of silver, why did they buy this field? To fulfill the word of God. To fulfill the word of God. That's why. That's why. And so a couple more verses talking, just talking about coming into his perception and his goodness. 
uh, believing his sovereignty that will be done for that. We got five slides. Okay. Romans 8, 20, 20 to 30. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. I'm going to pause for one second because we all know this verse that says that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, his purpose. If you are not living for his purpose, guess what? All things are not working to the good for you because you did not, you're not living for his purpose. If you're living for his purpose, all things would be working for your, for, uh, you would see all things that are working for good. All things are working for good. If you believe in his purpose, if you love his purpose, if you're living for his purpose, you see that a good that is working for. If you're not living for his purpose, you can't see that all things are working for the good. You're still strifing with life. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. So I love this because we think that it is someone's choice that they can become like Jesus Christ. It's not your choice. He foreknew, he predestined, he chose them before he even created the world. He decided who would become who would come into his the image of his son. So that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. In these whom he justified, he also glorified. I love this end of this, right? Because he said he predestined, so he chose them from the beginning. So this is where we're getting more and more and more, right? Into the um, flesh perspective, I would say. Going from the God perspective to the, to the flesh perspective. Full God perspective is God predestined them, right? Now, when they're in their flesh, he called them. Those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. This is the will of God for those that he chose, he predestined. He said, I chose you. I predestined. I chose this before anything has ever come about. This is why I say to you that, that your actions are doing nothing but, but revealing God's choices. Your choices are not even about you. Your choices are revealing to me God's choices. Those whom he predestined, he also called. So we look at this and we say, oh, God called you. God called you. God called you. He, ch he, chose, to, he chose to call you, right? And we think that, oh, it's just, you know, God chose, God, God chose you right now. He chose you for this moment. But we should understand that he chose you before you were ever born. There's nothing you did is why he called you. He's not calling you because you go to church. He's not calling you because, you, I don't know, you, 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 you uh, graduated from college. He's not calling you because of who your parents are. He's not calling you because of any of those things. He's calling you because he, he chose and he knew he was going to call you when you came into your flesh. And why is he justifying you? He's not justifying you because of what you, because of your choice and what you're doing. He's justifying you because he predestined to justify you. And also, why is he glorifying you? Is he glorifying you because of something you're doing? No. He's glorifying you because he predestined and chose from the beginning to glorify you. Once again, you have to ask, what is Elohim doing? Not what are you doing? What are you doing is not going to lead you to any revelation of who God is, what's going on of, of God's plan. It's not going to lead you to any revelation of his word or who Jesus Christ is. What God is doing is going to lead you to the revelation. So I love the situation that happened right here. We're going to read this because this is Jesus putting in this message. He is, um, this is how you, how do I say this? This is how you walk out this message, walk out this revelation that it is God that is doing, not people. 
It's God that is doing, not people. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned this who sinned this man or his parents that he would be born blind? Jesus answered, It was neither this man's sin nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. So once again, Jesus has a has a, has a perspective which is solely about what is God doing, which is gracious. The more you know God and you, you're you are telling people about what God is doing, you're pointing people to God's actions and his deeds and his word and his purpose. That is the, when you're finding the grace of God on your life. When you realize that things that have gone wrong in my life are not because of me. I'll look back at my life. It's because of God's word and his will that my parents got a divorce. It's because of God's purpose and his will. Why I had a brain bleed and I died when I was 15 years old. It's because of God's purpose and his will. Why I dealt with six, seven concussions after that. Why, why I could not continue playing football. Why I never got to see the fruit of my labor playing football. It's because of God's will. It's because of God's work. It's because of his, what he wants to do. Not because of anything I did. It wasn't punishment because of what I've done. It's because of his word is going to come true. The works of God will be displayed. God will be glorified. That's why. Now, I love this because we also see another person in John who Jesus said he loved. He called him his beloved. But we see another person in John who is is so he has this perception. He's he's he is he's there. There's no one in this Bible besides Jesus Christ, because you see him not only in the Gospels, but he is. <laughs> I mean, come on now. Revelation literally is called the revelation of Jesus Christ. So revelation is also Jesus Christ. But outside of Jesus Christ, there's no one huh, that's highly spiritually appraised in this whole Bible than John. Read this. I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance, which are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Why was he there? Many of us don't even know what happened to him, that they were trying to kill this man over and over and over again, and they couldn't kill him. So they, they left him stranded on the island. But hold on, I'm sorry. That's the fleshy perspective of why he was there. The real reason why he was there was because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. But I love this, though, because what's the story of your life? How are you telling the story of your life? John did not glorify the flesh as to why he was where he was. It wasn't because of people. <laughs> it wasn't because of what they were doing to him. It was because of God's purpose. It's because of God, because of the word of God and his testimony of Jesus why he was there. That's why he was there. So I ask you in your life, are you able to let go of your fleshy perspective of why? 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 Because when you're in the flesh, you want to explain so bad that this flesh reason, that flesh reason, because they did this and they did that and I did this and this happened and blah, 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 blah. but you're not telling the truth. Because the real reason why all these things have happened is because the word of God and the testimony of Jesus is why these things are happening because that is the will of God to be done in his life. Now we're going to go back to the top of Revelation. For a reason, Revelation 1, 1 to 3. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants, the things which must soon take place, and he sent and communicated by his angel to his bondservant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. Now, why am I giving you this? Why am I giving you this? Because Revelation. I'm going to read the beginning again. 
the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bond servants, the things which must soon take place. So the revelation of Jesus Christ is about the future. It's about what's to come. It's actually about what's to come all the way to the end. Like we literally know, you, you know, if you read it, you know, you know what's going to happen. But my point bringing this to you is because about revelation. Revelation of Jesus Christ is going to come true. And if you really become seeing, you start looking at the world and you start looking at what's going on and you realize that everything that is going on is because of that book. <laughs> That's actually reality. Is that everything that is going on is because it was written in the word of God in the revelation of Jesus Christ. So I challenge you to begin to look at your life and to begin to look at the world and to begin to look at everything and find the word of God that's being fulfilled. Because there is a word of God for everything that happens under the sun. There's a word of God as to why it's happening. Last thing I'll give you and then we'll be out of here. I am the Lord and there is no other. It's Isaiah 45. I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that men may know from the rising to the setting of the sun that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. The one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity. I am the Lord who does all these. Truth. There's no man doing anything. There's only what the Lord is doing. And if you really want to become understanding and seeing, and you really want to see, if you really want to see, I will start seeking what is Elohim doing? What is he doing? So this is lesson 54, I mean 64, I'm sorry. What is Elohim doing? We do tithe and offering. Amen. Faith pulls eight hundred dollars a week to ensure that God's work can and will continue through this ministry. The rest will be redistributed back out to those that gave. That's cash at money sign Christ King Way. That's PayPal at MFH Ministry. Um, love doing this lesson with you today. Lesson sixty four. Hope it brings you higher. We'll be back soon. Lesson sixty five. Be 